It's good to have Steve here. He hasn't been to the chapel yet. I've, I've told this story so many times. I'm sure most of you have heard it. But I reckon I've known Steve now just over 50 years. Um, and it's easy to um, remember how I met him. Um, my parents, we used to have a, a stand-up piano in our lounge. No one could play. Don't ask me why we had a piano that nobody could play. But if I had ever been played, it played... Uh, hymns that were written by Isaac Newton, no, not Isaac Newton, um, Isaac Watts, uh, John Newton sort of stuff. There was certainly nothing that it had played that uh, would have got you off your seats. And this young man came in and he, they, with another group of lads and they decided they were going to form a band. So they got this piano and they took the folded the top off, took the front off, took the bit out underneath it. I don't think anyone had touched this piano as a... And there he was, without music, just banging away at this um, uh, piano. And it was probably one of the most exciting things I'd ever heard of. But I, so Steve um, has been about a long while. And uh, he's been in the ministry. Uh, he was probably just about going into the ministry at that time, a bit later than that. But he, um, he said three churches that I know of. And he'll tell you this story, that the first one he was at, I used to go on a Sunday night with a load of us, used to go and listen to Steve, and they used to put their accounts on the wall. And the funniest thing I've ever seen was that the cleaner used to get paid more money than Steve did as pastor of the church. So that's from humble positions he has grown up to a pastor at a church at Waldronfield for 35 years. Uh, it's lovely to be here, lovely to see you. I must say, the last time I came to Bressonville, I hadn't seen the building before tonight, so it's lovely. Uh, very smart indeed. I, I'm sort of privileged to stand here, really, I think, um, after preaching for several years in the coffin down the road. Um, that's a long while ago. And, uh, yeah, those days, nice to reminisce sometimes, isn't it? I wasn't as hard on that piano as Peter says, but um, I'm third reserve pianist for Waldering Field. We've got some good musicians, but when they get desperate, they ask me to play still. I do play um, in bits and places, you know, not much. Um, but yeah, they were good days. And it brings me back to lovely memories of uh, dear Ivan. And uh, he went to heaven on my 23rd birthday in August the 28th, 1973. Uh, Robert as well, bless them. They were both in the group with me. Uh, had some lovely times. I had a discussion with Ivan one night, a, a strong discussion. He told me to stop letting other people wire my keyboards in, and it's time I learned to do it myself. Uh, in similar words to that. And, uh, and I said, you invited me to be a keyboard player, not an electrician. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, well, we had some wonderful times. Uh, and it's lovely to come and share with you. Um, I, I might share a few things as we go through I have to say, I, you make me feel very relaxed here. Um, so um, I, 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 you've picked four songs. I don't remember the names of them. Um, so I hope the music group are going to lead me through that. And um, we'll pray and we'll read God's word. And, I, and Kevin, you were an inspiration to me on the phone because I didn't know what to preach on. You talked about, you reminded me it was the coronation weekend. I thought I'd better speak about a king. So, uh, so we're going to be... In 1 Samuel 8 and 9 tonight, all right? So uh, thank you ever so much for that. Anyway, enough. do you want to sing first? Shall we sing first and then I'll pray? Yes? Come on, help me out because I don't know what we're doing. Uh, I'm, the Splendor of the King by the look of the screen, that's wonderful. I know that one. We're all right. Okay, and uh, let's uh, do what you normally do. Do you stand to sing? Yeah, right, okay. All yours, Kevin.
Great, thank you. Please be seated. Let's come to prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you so much. What a lovely reminder we've got tonight of how great you are. And thank you that we come to the creator of the universe. Beautiful sunshine outside reminds us again of the amazing solar system. You spoke and the stars fell into place. Uh, just this incredible solar system with the trees, the birds, the creation, the billions of miracles. Uh, we thank you that you're such an awesome God, but we praise you even more tonight because you are a God who recreates people's lives. And we thank you that uh, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. And we thank you that you take of our broken lives, our messed up lives, and you, uh, if we trust you, are prepared to forgive us. Uh, empower us by your spirit to seek to live a life uh, in fellowship with you. Uh, and Lord, we just praise you for the miracle of salvation. And we thank you for those here tonight that can rejoice in the fact that we have a saviour, we have a Lord in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know him personally. Uh, Lord, our longing is, we've just prayed in the vestry before, that uh, if there's any here that don't know you, that tonight we might come to trust you. And for those of us that do know you, that we'll get to know you better. Because that's our longing. Uh, and we just pray that you'll do a work in our hearts, through your word, by your spirit. So we thank you for bringing us together. We've just heard, and while I think of it, Peter has reminded us of those who are unwell, and we just underline all those names. I don't know all of them. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd meet with all these people. You are the great healer. You can heal. But all of our lives are in your hands, and we just commit them all to you and pray that you'd work out your purposes. But whatever happens, may they know the reality of your special presence. Uh, we thank you as we come tonight. Uh, we come in various situations. You know all about them. I don't. But uh, we may have come with problems tonight. I'm ever so glad that we've come to the greatest problem solver of all in the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you move in our hearts? Uh, you know what we need. I pray that you'll just make me a channel. Uh, we don't want to listen to Steve Winkle at all in one sense. We want you to speak. And we pray that you will. Uh, and that you'll touch our lives. We want to go out of this place differently from the way that we've come in because of an encounter with the living Lord Jesus. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. On this coronation weekend, we pray again for King Charles III, and we thank you for him, and we thank you for his mother's long reign and for her trust in you. And, Lord, we would long for the coming days that King Charles, and what we would pray for him, we'd pray for the whole royal family, that they might... No, we often sing now, God save our gracious King. And we pray that spiritually. If he doesn't know you, I don't know his heart, you do. But if he doesn't know you, we pray that he'll come to know you. And we would love to see yet in this land, through the royal family, through the government, through leaders, uh, people who stand up and lead us back to the things of God, to the God of heaven, to the word of God. Uh, Lord, we would love to see that. And humanly... If we're honest, some of us are sitting here probably thinking, well, that's never going to happen. But I'm ever so grateful tonight that it can because we come to a God of whom nothing is too hard. Will you work in our lives tonight? Uh, you know all about us. Uh, thank you that we're just part of a massive crowd of people who are one day going to meet together in heaven. Thank you that this broken world one day will end and we will rejoice if our trust is in you in a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Thank you that you have defeated death and the grave, that you're alive forevermore, that you hold the keys of death and hell. Uh, we praise you. Uh, what a comfort it brings. Uh, whatever we may be going through, meet with us, we pray. And uh, I ask, Lord, that tonight, through it all, Jesus Christ will be praised and our lives affected and changed. And to you be all glory. So just be with us and lead and guide us, we pray. Uh, and... We ask it all in the wonderful name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Um, Stuart, when he emailed me, he said, talk about, tell them about Waldringfield and everything. Well, I retired September the 30th. Um, and the next person that asked me, what is retirement life? Don't ask me. Just don't ask me. Um, I'm just 
tired, not retired. Uh, no, it's going all right, really. A uh, little bit of adjusting. I, did, I will tell you this much, that I did offer to get right out of Waldering Field and got right out of James's hair and out of the church's hair. I, as you probably know, we did 35 years in the ministry. Um, and, uh, and they actually said, and I hope they meant it, because I took it as they did, they said, please stay. And so I'm still doing some preaching. Some of you watch on live stream, and that's lovely. Um, so we're still preaching. I preached this morning at Waldering Field. I'm preaching all next Sunday morning and evening there. Uh, keeping quite busy. And um, it's encouraging. There's lots of encouragements when you go around as well, because um, we've been going to the prisons as well since 2010, a team from Waldering Field. Um, and uh, we were in the prison last Sunday morning. Uh, I will tell you a little thing that happened there. That it's wonderful, just to encourage. Some of you may know this, of course, but we go to Warren Hill, the closed prison, and then to Hosley, the open prison, and repeat the service. Well, it's difficult to preach a repeat, but we do. Um, and I preached in the closed Warren Hill prison last Sunday morning, and the chaplain who was with us just passed me a note before I was about to close in prayer, and one of the lads um, was leaving the prison. He'd done his time. It was quite a serious offence, which I won't talk about. And uh, so uh, his name is Sean. So he said, uh, just mention Sean in your final prayer. So I actually thought, well, I, you know. So I stopped. I said, before we pray, Sean, I think you're leaving Tuesday. And he said, yep, I am. And I said, uh, I'd like to pray for you. If you feel courageous enough, do you want to come up the front and I'll put my arm around you and pray for you? And he thought, oh, yeah, I'll do that, you know, so up he came. And uh, there's also, I say, there's a real move of the Spirit of God in there because there are several of them who've come to know the Lord, including Sam, who's the pianist now. He's an inmate. He's a very good pianist, probably better than any row I made at Peter's house years ago. Um, and uh, so he's just sitting on the piano. He played for us and the group had played and so on. So I said, right, well, well let's pray for Sean. And then all of a sudden, these prisoners just came out. They said, well, we want to we come and join him. So they all came and put their hands on him, and we're, I was surrounded by all these dodgy prisoners. No, I wouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> uh, and many of them come to know the Lord, which is great. Uh, and what was touching, and I'm quite an emotional person. If you don't know me very well, you know, I cry at the opening of a supermarket. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, as, as I prayed for him and finished the meeting off. As soon as it was finished, Sam on the piano knew that Sean's favourite hymn was There is a Redeemer. And so he just struck up. And it was so moving because all this lot were just surrounding me up the front and those sitting down. And they sang There is a Redeemer. And, uh, you know, you could have knocked me down with a feather really. But I tell you that because just to say, you know, sometimes you go to churches. Well, I went to I had one service at Warwickfield years ago and I shook hands at the door and the lady came up to me and she said, I want to tell you, I got absolutely nothing out of your service today. <laughs> now, if you feel like that tonight, will you just shut up, all right? <laughs> uh, but, uh, and you go to places and they oh, lovely. You know, isn't it nice to see a response? I will tell you one other that uh, comes to mind because you probably know every year... Uh, I'd be very blessed to go and pastor and preach at a church in South Tenerife. Some of you will know it. The South Tenerife Christian Fellowship, if you don't know, it seats up to 300 and it's above a supermarket. It's a great position and I love it. I do love the beach as well, I will admit. But um, we went there. Well, we were there last May. In fact, this time last year I was preaching at South Tenerife. And uh, the first Sunday we were there, there was a big crowd you have to be aware, it's very different to mainly the English churches because you just, as soon as you say the final benediction, you dive to the back because all they want to do is get out like a football match, you know. They just fly out past you and you, you're doing this, lovely to, lovely, lovely, to, lovely to see you, you know, and it's a bit like that. But then after that, you usually get one or two people waiting to talk to you. And the first Sunday I was there last May, so a year ago, um, all came flying out. There's a little group of people waiting to talk to me. And at the front was a lady, an older lady. And uh, she was on holiday from Stockport. And she's in floods of tears. I said, come here, what's going on? And she said, don't look now. But uh, she said, my husband is here. He's, he's the only one still sitting in the church. Now it was fairly full and he, 
Sure enough, he was sitting in a chair. Everybody else had got up and gone. And she said, I want to just tell you, I've been praying for my husband for 50 years. And she said, he is not interested in spiritual things. We've come on holiday. I said I was coming here this morning. And uh, she said, I said to him at breakfast time, do you want to come with me? And he reluctantly said he'd come. And God spoke to his heart. <coughs> Uh, and it was so encouraging. This lady said, God has answered my prayers this morning. And I had a long chat with him after the service and prayed with him and so on. But I, I just say that. It's nothing to do with Steve Winkle, by the way. He's a car crash of a Christian. But uh, I just want to say, God is still at work. Ever so easy. I think COVID has bashed the church a bit. Uh, and uh, it's ever so easy to start looking horizontally. But, you know, God is still on the throne. God is still at work. We need to believe that. And that really fits in with what I want to say tonight. Um, but I won't start on that just yet. We'll, uh, we'll have a few more songs before I start on that. Um, we'll have a read in a minute. I'll tell you what, let's, should we have another song now? Yeah, let's have another song. Let's have the second song. Which I haven't got a clue what it is. Oh, I do. In the darkness we were waiting. Without hope, without light. You're going to have to sing loud. I don't know this one. I don't think. I might recognise it. You'll lead us, Kevin. And praise the Lord because you know I'm a dry speaker and I'm proud of you.
Lovely, thank you. Please be seated. That's a new one on me. That's lovely. There. Right, I want to... Oh, I'm going to read from the NIV. And it's um, 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and the first seven verses. As I say, um, obviously this coronation weekend, lots of choice of kings in the Old Testament, of course, between the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of the firstborn was Joel, the name of the second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You're old, your sons do not follow in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when he, they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not that they have rejected, it is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. I'm, I'm leave it just there. Uh, and I said, we will go into chapter 9, keep your markers in, whatever, um, and we'll have a look at that in just a moment. I think we'll just have another song, and, you, and we'll look into God's word, shall we? That's lovely. Thank you. I know this one. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the king of glory, the king above all kings. So let's stand to sing, and then we'll look into God's word.
Great, thank you. That's lovely. Good. Well, I'd let me invite you to turn in the Bibles to, and we'll make it right this time, 1 Samuel chapter 8, not 7, all right? Uh, and we're going to start there. Um, I, I love, when I first started preaching years and years ago, um, I used to be a New Testament preacher, really, you know? In fact, when I first started preaching, I used to go around all these tiny little churches and I used to regurgitate three messages, really. You'd either get John 9 or Revelation 1, unto him who hath loved us and washed us from our sins. John 9 was a blind man, it was uh, Siloam and so on. Oh, and Saul of Tarsus, Acts chapter 9. Well, you'll be pleased to know we've, we've moved on a little bit since then. God has been gracious. And um, I love the Old Testament, really, if I'm honest, because uh, I used to avoid it. But actually, it's a wonderful typology and some great challenges in the Old Testament. And I say, particularly in the light of uh, the coronation, I thought, with God's enabling, I'd like to go to this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 8 onwards. Uh, interesting point, with the fact, of course, the Old Testament, much of it is to do with Israel, the land of Israel. Israel, of course, um, the Israelites, of course, were in bondage and slavery. God called Moses at the burning bush. Always interesting to me that, and I've probably said some of these things before, uh, but then Christine says that people don't remember what you preached on last Sunday, let alone you know, when you came before. Um, but it's always interesting if you, if you look back, and don't worry now, but in Exodus chapter 3, when, when Moses, God meets him at the burning bush, uh, you know, an amazing experience and speaks to him, take your shoes off, you're on holy ground, you're going to, I want you to be the man to go into Egypt and bring my people out of Egypt, out of their slavery. And he didn't really want to go, but eventually he agrees to go. And you get to Exodus chapter 4, I think it's verse 18, where when he eventually goes, he goes to his father-in-law, who he's working for, looking after the sheep as a shepherd. His name is Jethro, or Ruel, you might have a different version of the Bible. And he, he speaks to to Jethro, and he says, can I go back to Egypt to visit my brothers? And you think, what? If I'd have had an experience of a burning bush on the way to Fressingfield tonight, I'd have told you before we even started the meeting, you know? Well, how exciting is that? Why didn't he do that? Now, I'm getting sidetracked already, and I mustn't get into another message, but only to say, of course, that I think the reason, I, it's only the Steve Winkle theory, but... Uh, at that time, his father-in-law, Jethro, was a, a, a pagan Midian priest who had no understanding of God. And uh, so it's a bit like if there's somebody here tonight and you're the only person in the family who's a Christian, you go home and you say, go oh, you should have been at Fressingfield tonight. And you start, you think, no, they're not singing from the same page as me at the moment. Interestingly, um, you go right through... Um, Moses goes, of course. Jethro uh, hears what's going on, and you get to chapter 18 of Exodus, and Jethro, in our terms, is converted. Everything's changed. Uh, I think sometimes there's a time to be quiet, even as Christians. I don't want us to dodge the bullet and say, oh, well, the preacher said tonight we can be quiet all the time. No, I'm not saying that. Um, anyway, Moses, he leads them out. He dies. Jo Joshua takes on. Uh, uh, eventually, Joshua goes, the judges, got a book on the judges, they take over. You go through the judges like Samson and Gideon and others. You get through that, and then you get to 1 Samuel. Very interesting, because uh, they now want to have a king. They've not had a king before. They've been led by Moses and by Joshua and by the judges. They've not had a king, but they come here, uh, and we read about it here in 1 Samuel, and they come to Samuel and said, look, we, we want a king because there's two reasons. One's a bad reason, one's a sad reason. Uh, the bad reason is it's peer pressure. They're looking around, they're saying, do you know that nation over there has got a king and they've got a king and they've got a king and they've got a king. We haven't got a king. They sort of overlook the fact that they had the most wonderful king of all, the God of heaven, and they weren't trusting him as they should. So they were looking horizontally instead of vertically. And so as a result, they said, uh, we want a king. So that was a bad reason. The other was a sad reason. We've read about it here in these early verses of 1 Samuel chapter 8 because you'll notice that Samuel, who's the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, he wants to promote his two boys to lead the nation. 
And you'll notice, I think it's in verse 5, where it says, uh, his sons do not walk in your ways. So that was perhaps a legitimate reason, because Samuel, I think in this, Samuel was wonderful. I have much to say about, uh, in a positive way about Samuel, but on this occasion I think he made a mistake. He tried to promote his sons to lead the, the nation, but they didn't know God. So the people rightly said, we want a king. And God allowed it. And you'll notice by the verses that we read, I won't take time to dive into those just now. But you'll notice that uh, Samuel was displeased with that and said, no, the Lord says, give them their king. So we're talking about the first king. We think about King Charles. We think about the first king that Israel ever had. Uh, and that was interesting. And when you get to chapter 9, if you've got your Bibles open, you'll see that he was... Uh, humanly speaking, you couldn't ask for somebody better, really, because if you look at verses 1 and 2 of 1 Samuel chapter 9, it says that a man of Benjamin, whose, um, whose name was Kish, the son of Abel, the son of Zerah, uh, the son of Bacharoth, the son of yeah, the several sons, a mighty man of power, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel, and from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So you get this picture. He was a good looker, and he was tall, and, you know, he was a big man. You think he, he's, he's ideal, humanly speaking. So we, we, we read about him, and you think, well, what a great king he'll make. Uh, and God has over said, yes, I'll all allow you to have this king. Um, and so... Samuel goes. Now, I'm not going to get involved in Samuel chapter 9, 1 Samuel chapter 9, where they go chasing after some donkeys, but eventually Samuel meets up to anoint Saul as king. And you get to verses 15, let me go to, I think it's verses 15 and 16 of chapter 9. And uh, the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin. You shall anoint him commander over my people Israel. Now note this, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. So there's a wonderful promise. God he says to Samuel, go and anoint Saul as this new king of Israel, and they'll be the first king. And by the way, the arch enemy, you could read about them in chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 7 of this uh, 1 Samuel, you will see that the arch enemy at that time were the Philistines. And so he said, look, I'm going to make you a promise. You are going to save my people from the hand of the Philistines. And you think he's going to deliver them from the Philistines? That's absolutely fantastic. Shall I tell you something? Saul reigned for 40 years. Some Bible students think 42. I'm not going to quibble about two years. He reigned for over 40 years anyway. And he was on that throne. And you know, he never won a victory against the Philistines. You say, well, God promised him one. Back there in uh, uh, verse 16 of chapter 9. He had 40 years on the throne. And actually, tragically, some of you will know this anyway, that Saul ended his life in chapter 31 when, he tri 31 when he tries to kill himself, and he's a victim of the Philistines, the very enemy that God had said, you were going to win a victory over. Uh, David, of course, won a victory over the Philistines. We know that from 1 Samuel 17, where he took on Goliath and won the victory. David did, but Saul didn't. And we've got a problem tonight. Because here we are, and we've got the Bible open, and God has made a promise, and the promise hasn't been kept. And we've got, that's dodgy. That's difficult. So, and you say, well, Steve, there's thousands of promises in the Word of God. You're dead right. I never quote how many promises there are, because I've looked in several commentaries, and they differ by thousands. So I'll just say there's thousands of promises, all right? So are we on dodgy ground tonight here at Fressingfield in the, that we're looking at promises that God made that he never kept? Uh, well, you know I don't really believe that. So what happened? Well, is it that God is unreliable? No, I don't believe that's the answer. You see, there's two characteristics about the promises of God that we need to remember. If you go through Scripture, you'll find almost every promise is conditional. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, not always. There's, there's a promise that God says which 
we don't have to do anything about it. If you got a rain shower this, this evening in Fressing Field and the standards field signing, you know you would see a rainbow. And that's a pro you'll say, oh, that's a promise of God. Some people have made it something else, sadly. But there's a promise from God that God promised never to flood the world again. Uh, and he keeps that promise. Now, you don't have to do anything about that, nor do I. That's not a conditional promise. That's a certain promise. But the majority of the promises in the word of God are conditional. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, you can go and questionable. I'll go to a proverb, which some would question is not a promise, but we'll, we'll keep it as such. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Do you know how it goes? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And then God says, I will direct your paths. But the first bit is our responsibility. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. Then God says, if you do your part, I'll do my part. And you'll find as you go through scripture, there are promise after promise. You think of the disciples, they were called, what happened? Jesus said to them, to those fishermen, he said, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. If you do your part, you follow me. There's Christians say, I, I can't witness. I, no, I can't in my own strength either. They think, well, you're a pastor, you've got a lot to say in the pulpit, but not so good outside. Uh, that's true, because it's difficult, isn't it? In an in a, a increasingly atheistic society, you, think, well, you know, it's not easy to witness. Jesus says, follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. Leave that bit to me. You do your part, I'll do my part. We could go, I could spend a lot of time on the promises of God tonight and we haven't got that sort of time. So they're conditional. I'm sure I've used this before, but my daughter, I've got three children all grown up and I've got seven grandchildren now and they're lovely, but my youngest daughter, who's just turned 37, when she was a child, just we'd moved to Walderingfield any sort of four or five years, she'd be about six years old, and she used to get up on a Saturday morning when there was no school and she'd come to dad, not to mum, because mum's a bit harder than dad, and she'd say, Daddy, can we go down the shop? There was one shop in Warwick, that's long gone by the way, there's none now, but uh, can we go down the shop to Mr Beaton's? Because he sells sweets. And if you take me down the shop to Mr Beaton's and buy me some sweets, then when we come home, I'll tidy my bedroom. She said, I said, Rebecca, I've got a better idea. I've got a far better idea than that. If you tidy your bedroom, then I'll go down to Mr. Beaton's and buy you some sweets. You know, there's a lot of people that try and do business with God the wrong way round. Lord, I'm in a muddle. If you do this for me, then I promise I do. I'll... Oh, dangerous ground. And actually, remember this. You and I haven't got anything to bargain with God anyway. Nothing. In his grace and mercy, he fulfills his promises, providing we do our part. So the two reasons are, the promises are conditional. Did God break a promise here? No, I don't believe so, because it's conditional. Saul, if you do your part, I'll do my part. Well, what happened? Well, there's three portions of scripture going on in, in, uh, in uh, 1 Samuel. And what happened? He's got this promise from God. He's made king, and uh, he's got this promise from God that he's going to win a victory against the Philistines. Now, the Philistines, you know, humanly, they are mighty. They're a big army and everything else. But he's got the promise of God. So, you get to uh, uh, chapter 13. And if you look at chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, and you get to verses 5 and 6 and 7, the Philistines gather together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. Now that sounds pretty daunting, doesn't it? I'll agree with that. They came up and encamped in Mishmash to the east of Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that uh, they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gil Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Right? He's got a promise from God. 
but he's looking horizontally. He's forgotten the promise vertically. And then you go to 1 Samuel 17, I've already referred to this chapter, David and Goliath and so on. And you get to verse 11, and it says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, talking about Goliath, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And the same, I won't take time to turn to it, but you've got the same, exactly, almost identical verse in chapter 28 and verse 5. You see, why didn't Saul, this new king of Israel, prove God? He could have done. The answer is he didn't believe the promises of God. He thought that, looking horizontally, that the power of the enemy was greater than the power of the God that had made a promise to him. And it's one of the easiest things for us as Christians, if we're Christians tonight, many of us are, to look in a horizontal direction. Uh, we praise God for our salvation. We rejoice. We give a testimony sometimes. We don't doubt that we're going to heaven. And I don't doubt that either because once we're truly trusted Christ, I believe we're in him <laughs> eternally. But in between times, actually, we're living like atheists. We're living like the next door neighbor who's got no trust in God at all. And we kid ourselves that we're trusting God, but actually... We're not really at all. We're living for ourselves because we're looking in the wrong direction. Now I know you say, Stephen, that's ever so easy to preach on, but what about you? And you're dead right because it's a challenge to me as well. You see, uh, they were humanly outnumbered. Uh, the fact that God had made a promise to Saul was irrelevant, actually, because although God had made this promise and God always keeps his promises, he never proved God's promises in his own life or indeed the people of Israel at that time. You know, it's a human thing, isn't it? That we, humanly, we try and sort it out. You, I, I've been a Christian now, look, I, was, um, I became a Christian when I was nearly 17. Well, I even made professions before then, but I always think really I committed my life to the Lord when I was nearly 17. Uh, August the 3rd, 1967. And you've already worked out my age because I've given it away tonight already. If you don't know, I'm nearly 73. I heard the gasp. I look young, I know. But uh, I'm nearly 73. Um, you know, uh, I ended up, after listening to Moody Corral, coming to know the Lord, I ended up going to America. This is while I was single. First year I got married, we ended up in Margate. But before that, I used to go abroad. No, I won't get on that one. But uh, as a result, we went to America. And uh, the Moody Corral whose choir, this American choir, and the testimony of one of their singers, um, God used, heard that I was uh, converted through their ministry, and so they invited me to the Moody Bible Institute. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, and the fella who sang in the choir, who gave his testimony, who God used, um, I went and spent some time with. Before I went to the Moody Bible Institute, we stayed at his house just outside... Detroit in a place called Pontiac and I stayed for the weekend with him and uh, Kenneth McMillan was his name uh, wonderful testimony I haven't got time to tell you all tonight but uh, as a result on the Monday morning I had a wonderful weekend with him I, I had a bit of a rude awakening as a Christian as a young Christian because him and his family got up at half past five in the morning for an hour of devotions and I, I hold my hand up and say I didn't know there was such a time you know <laughs> Uh, and they got up and they used to sing together in parts and they, they read the scriptures together and they had a, a box with missionaries they prayed. Amazing, you know, and I'd hardly got my eyes open when I was at those meetings. But anyway, on the Monday morning, he took me to the, the Greyhound bus station. Uh, and I'd never been on a Greyhound bus on, in America before. And we got there, and I'm travelling alone, and Kenneth stood beside the bus and he said, you know, we've had a lovely time. He said, yes, we have. And he prayed with me. And he said, just be careful when you get to Chicago. He said, because when you get to Chicago, uh, you'll need a taxi to go to the Maryland Hotel where you've been booked into by the Moody Bible Institute. And this is what he said. I've used the American. If you're American, you'll know better than me. But he said, it's, it's eight blocks from the Greyhound bus station. Well, that doesn't sound very far to me, you know. So he said, be careful because some of these Chicago taxi boys They'll take you for a ride, really, a really a ride, you see. Some of them are a bit dishonest, he was really saying. So, of course, I travelled this, I think it was nine hours on this coach. 
got to there, got onto the street, and if you've been to Chicago, massive yellow taxis everywhere, you see. And of course, I'm a bit on my guard after what he said, you see. So I looked at this yellow taxi coming along, and I thought, no, I don't think he's very honest. <laughs> <laughs> he probably was the nicest bloke out. But anyway, after about three taxis, I held one down. And I sat in the back, I'm on my own, a big case, sat in the back. And he said, uh, where are you going? I said, the Maryland Hotel. He said, okay. He said, uh, this is exactly, it's almost word for word, I can remember it. He said, uh, and this is back in 1974. He said, uh, have you been to America before? And I said, no, I haven't. He said, have you been to Chicago before? I said, no, I haven't. He said, I'll show you the sights of the city. And I thought, no way. The very trap that I was trying to avoid, I'd fallen into, you see. And, and why do I tell you this story? I'll tell you why. Uh, a wonderful answer to prayer, which I can't guarantee every time you pray. I'll tell you that in a moment. But, but you know, I sat in the back of that taxi, and I'm a Christian. All right, seven years a Christian. I sat in the back of that taxi with my case, and I thought, I've got caught here, haven't I? And I hadn't got a great deal of money with me. And I don't know about you, whenever you're in a taxi, I only look at one thing, I look at the fare meter, you know, and I'm clicking away. And so I sat in the back and I thought, dive out at the next traffic lights. <laughs> that, and I thought, I can't, I've got this great big case, you know, I'm never going to get away with it, you know. But what I'm saying is, I sat in the back of that taxi and I thought, every way I possibly could, and then all of a sudden, I thought, Stephen... You're a Christian, for goodness sake. You've thought of this and that. Why don't you try praying? And I didn't get on my knees or anything. I didn't even shut my eyes. But I said, Lord, you know the muddle I'm in. Um, would you help me? Now, I can't guarantee, this is true, but I can't guarantee all your prayers are going to be answered like this. But um, within 15 seconds, not exaggerating, this driver turned and he said, uh, I was in London last year. I said, oh, where are you? I said, I'm about 72 miles away from there. He said, I hadn't got much money. I don't suppose you have. And I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. And he, uh, it's never happened before or since. He leaned across to the fair meter and he switched it off. True as I'm standing here, a taxi driver switched the fare off. Nothing. Now I'm on another, another guilt trip. Because I'm a Christian and I'm not, I can't accept a free ride, you know. So eventually we got that. And I, I hold my hand up. As soon as he turned the fare meter off, I said, yes, show me the sights of the city. I'm quite happy to see them now. <laughs> uh, but eventually we get to the Maryland Hotel. And I get out and I get some money out. And I said, come on, you've got to take something. Do you know he wouldn't even take a tip? He wouldn't take one dollar. He wouldn't take anything. Now, don't try it because it probably won't work for you. But the reason I tell you that is because, and even now, there's a challenge to me. You say you're a pastor, even a pastor for years I have, you know, there's so many times that I still think horizontally first before I think vertically. Because God has made promises in your life and in mine, and if we would just learn to trust him, I must have told you before, I tell everybody, but the most profound chorus, according to Steve Winkle, that you'll ever sing in your life you probably don't sing it much now but he was to sing it a lot and it was trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey and actually all it is is trust and obey and you'll prove God the problem is we sing it heartily and we preach about it and then we don't put it into practice see promise the promises of God God doesn't break his promises but there's a responsibility upon us because these promises are condi conditional. You see, um, you go through scripture. Uh, what time have you finished? Seven o'clock you finish. I'm nearly there. Uh, give me five more minutes. One or two reluctant nods. Okay. Um, you see, um, when the Israelites go to stay with the Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, all right, God said to them, I, you'll have to take this from me, but God says to them, I've given you the land. I've given you the land. You can go to the land of Canaan. That's the promised land. You can go for it. You go to Deuteronomy 1 verse 2 and it says, 
you can get there in 11 days. Some preachers dispute 11 days and they say, well, actually, there's a little bit more distance than that. We'll say three weeks, 21 days, all right? So they, they say, radio, we're going to go. And they get out of Egypt. And praise God, they have problems and they panic at the Red Sea, but God makes a way through the Red Sea. You get to Exodus chapter 15, they're praising God and so on. But what happens? They get stuck in the wilderness. You know, and I don't, I haven't got time to tell you, but they walk ground in circles for 40 years, and that generation never even made it, apart from Caleb and Joshua, because they didn't trust and obey God. Although he'd said it a hundred times in the first six books of the Bible, we read, I've given you the land, I've given you the land, I've given you the land, but they didn't trust God's word. They looked horizontally, not vertically. And as a result, well, they sent spies out after two years and so on. God sent them manna. I've spoken about this at Fressingfield before, so forgive me, I'm just repeating for a second for those that didn't hear. That, that's a little favourite of mine. God gave them manna. I used to sing songs when I was in the Brethren Assembly when I was young about manna sweet and how wonderful it is. Do you know what I think? I don't think we should even read about it in the Bible because the Bible tells me that if they'd have made it in, and we say we're being generous, for three weeks to make the journey to Canaan, They'd have been there in 21 days. Do you know what day God gave them the manna? Day 45. They shouldn't even have been there. We don't need to read about it. And then they did uh, have the manna. God gave them the manna every day except the Sabbath day, double portion the day before and so on. And they lived on that manna until eventually, through Joshua, Joshua chapter 5, they entered the land at that point. But up till then they lived on manna every day. And you'll know, and I've told you this before so I've rushed over it, but you'll know that they had manna all day. They had the same meal every day. You'd be bored stiff with the same meal every day, and so would I. But that's what they had to eat. And not surprisingly, you get to Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, and it says, we're fed up. They come to Moses and they we're fed up with manna. We're fed up. We have it for breakfast. We have it for dinner. We have it for tea. And uh, please, you we were better off in the land of Egypt. So they looked back. That's a great danger. When we don't trust the promises of God, I'll tell you what you'll do. You'll start looking back instead of forward. And they looked back, and they got their rose-coloured spectacles on, and they said, you know, <laughs> we were better off in Egypt. We had the, the cucumbers there, and we had the melons there, and we had the leeks there. And saddest of all, they said, we had the garlic there. And if you, don't, if you like garlic, I'm going to pray for you, because I can't stand the stuff. It should be banned by law. But as they long for garlic, because they were fed up, God sustained them, but they weren't satisfied. And interestingly, in Exodus chapter 16, verse 31, you'll read what manna is. I won't take time to turn to it, but it says, the manna was white and tasted like honey. Hang on. Is there a little ring a bell there? What did God say about the promised land? He said, go to the promised land. I've given it to you. It's a land flowing with milk and honey you're living on tasters you're sustained but you're not satisfied and why because you're not really trusting my promises one more and I'll shut up go to the New Testament John chapter 6 feeding of the 5,000 recorded in all four gospels as you know but John chapter 6 we'll take John chapter 6 all right and Andrew and Philip go around there's a great crowd um, and they follow Jesus give them something to eat and you know what it is, they go around and they find one little boy with five loaves and two fish. And do you remember what they say? Andrew says, well, there's a little fella here, he's brought his lunch, and these, these five loaves, by the way, were probably little bread rolls. Uh, there's a lad here with five loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? And then Philip says, hang on, um, do you know, he said, to feed this lot, 200 denarii wouldn't be enough. He's thinking of all the finance to feed them. And uh, you know the sad thing? They're standing next to the creator of the universe. And they're limiting him. They say, we can't do it. You know, so often we're just the same. Um, I love George Muller. I talked about him this morning at Wolverine I love George Muller. George Muller was, had a bad upbringing. He got into terrible trouble. He was in prison by the time he was 16. He came out of prison when he was 20, and uh, he met a friend who happened to be a Christian. He knew nothing about Christian things, the Bible, anything. 
but he met this friend who was a Christian. And this Christian friend said, I've got a meeting tonight. It wasn't even a Sunday meeting, it was a midweek prayer meeting. And uh, George, probably we'd have said, I'm not really suitable for you. But as a result, George Muller went to this prayer meeting and he came out of that place and he said, I've listened to these people praying and all I can tell you is this, that they actually know God. That was such the impression that made on his heart and he committed his life to Christ. And you'll probably know that uh, he, became a, he moved to England, he became a pastor in Bristol. Um, he had five orphanages. Um, uh, he opened up for, for homeless children and so on. But the wonderful thing about George Muller I love is, you know what? He never ever asked a human being for money. The whole, he lived till he was 93. He never once asked any human being for money. He spent his time praying to God and trusting God and trusting God's promises. And as a result, let me tell you, and think of the age in which he lived. He established 117 schools involving 120,000 children. He cared for over 10,000 orphans in five orphanages. He gave away one and a half million New Testaments and a quarter of a million Bibles, gave them away, and never once was he in the red. But he never asked anybody, he only asked one person. He went to God, spoke to him. And I said this morning, and so I'll repeat it, but somebody's done the maths, I, I'm not very good at maths. They'll never make me the church treasurer, or we'll be in terrible trouble. But uh, evidently, if you relate to what he was given, what God gave him, yes, through people, but he never asked them for it. Uh, he supplied all his needs, all of his life, never once going in the red, and it was the equivalent of 1.5 to 2 million pounds in today's money. Because he took God at his word. I've got some more notes here, but I think you've got the message and probably you're all saying, for goodness sake, stop, Winkle. Um, and it's a message to me as well. If we're Christians tonight, are we going to trust and obey? <laughs> or are we kidding ourselves that we're trusting God? And actually, we don't pray an awful lot. And actually, we're quite self-reliant. It's tragic, really, isn't it? There's promises in this Bible I still haven't proved. And probably you could say the same. God never breaks his promises, but they're conditional. God says, if you do, then I will. Um, I was going to say more, but I'm going to stop there. I, I just pray that tonight, and by the way, if you're here and you're not a Christian, um, when I was nearly 17, <laughs> through that testimony, I just recognized that the man who was speaking knew God. Uh, his father had been shot as a missionary three years earlier in Africa. And all he wanted to do was tell these people that shot his dad about Jesus. And I came to the conclusion he's either a madman or he's got the love of Christ in his life. And I found out it was the latter. And as a result, I went home and prayed. And when I prayed and asked the Lord to come into my life on August the 3rd, 1967, as soon as I prayed, there was a storm, there was lightning, there was thunder. No, rubbish. No, there wasn't. I tell you what, I didn't feel a bit different. In fact, I prayed the same prayer the next night because I thought God didn't hear me last night, I'll try again. <laughs> And I did it for weeks. And you won't get an assurance until you get stuck into the word of God. Prayer, I tell you what, I believe I'm going to heaven and I'm saved as true as I'm standing in this pulpit tonight. But I couldn't have told you that after two days of being a Christian. <laughs> uh, but God keeps his promises. Uh, and I pray that we'll know God, trust him, call out to him. Whoever Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Even if your feelings don't change, believe it because God said it. And then trust his promises. There's loads of them, thousands of them. Let's do our part and prove him in these days. It doesn't matter about the atheistic society in which we live. There's a lot of challenges, isn't there? But God hasn't changed. He's an eternal God. He's an almighty God. And what he says he will do. And one day, if we are trusted in him, he'll take us to be with himself in heaven. Then we'll have a new heaven and a new earth where all this mess will be gone. 
No more COVID. Praise the Lord. Anyway, I'm going to pray because I'll just carry on. I've got a lad in the prison at Hosley that thinks I preach for England. No, we'll stop. But uh, I pray that God will speak to your heart and mine, that we'll learn to trust him more, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Will you help us, Lord? We think of kings this weekend. We pray for Charles. We pray that you'll anoint him. We pray that you'll touch him by your spirit. I don't know the state of his heart, but you do. I would love to see King Charles leading this country back to God and those around him and the leaders of our land and the leaders in our pulpits. Make them strong in your word. Keep us looking to you. Save us from looking horizontally at the problems, but remind us of the promises of God and the God that never changes and promises to keep his word. Do a work in all of our lives tonight, we pray, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You are so patient with me. Thank you ever so much. My wife is not here tonight, otherwise she'd have waved a hymn book about 15 minutes ago. Uh, but anyway, we're gonna have, a, have we got time for a song? No buses in Fressingfield tonight? <laughs> Let's have a final song. Come on. Thank you ever so much. finish with prayer. Lord, thank you. May those words we've just sung and listened to be the expression of our heart. Lord, you know all about us, individually, our families, all that's going on in our lives. Work out your purposes. Touch our lives. Help us to trust you more. Help us to believe your word uh, when there's so many things that will distract us and pull us away and give us doubts. Help us to trust you, uh, knowing that you know the end from the beginning uh, and uh, as we're reminded in Psalms, as for God, his way is perfect. Help us to lean on you. Bless our families, bless our homes. Be with us in our informal fellowship as we go into this week. Continue with us. May we prove you in our lives. May we be a blessing to others. Keep me shining, Lord. Keep me shining, Lord, in all I say and do, that the world might see Christ lives in me and learn to love him too. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen.